I understand one of the things that gets done after there's been a major hurricane event is to go out and try to create some sort of record of the water depths and the water surface um, that represents the flood, <coughs> both from storm surge and uh, flooding of rivers and so on. Right. And I was wondering if you could explain to me a little bit how that data gets collected, um, what kind of t turnaround time there is involved in doing that, and what kind of logistically what it takes to go out and collect all that perishable data and put it together into some kind of okay. comprehensive result. Well, it's interesting you said perishable data because that's exactly what we call it. And um, it, so it's important that we get out relatively quickly in, in the first week, certainly, to be able to, um, to start to collect that data before people begin to disturb the, the uh, affected area. So particularly like wind waterline data there's a distinct pattern between the way debris is spread f by wind and by water. So th that's usually used by building explain science a little, people. Like, explain a little bit? Well, I'm not a building science expert, but <laughs> my understanding is, is that generally um, um, flooding, base, flooding debris is, um, is usually sort of collected in sort of these lines, if I, if I understand it correctly. And uh, wind tends to be more uniformly scattered over the area. So usually, um, building science experts are able to pretty accurately discern where that is. So could you look at things like where there's mud and silt yeah, left absolutely. on buildings or spread on the ground? There's a whole bunch of indicators that are, yeah. Where large stands of trees might have all fallen in a, in a particular direction or Correct. indicate wind rather than water or right. something along those lines. Right. So why is that data considered perishable and people well, usually, you We're know, following field. Um, well, following a disaster, people are interested in you know getting getting things squared away again. So they begin to clean up, and those clues that you just described and I talked about briefly are are begin to be disturbed by uh, by people cleaning up. So that's why it's perishable. On the high water mark side, um, there typically are sort of like mud lines, or there's a there's sort of this you know sort of like a pool that had drained slowly you can see where that water line was, um, and it becomes more and more difficult to find those, those clear lines as time goes on. So you typically try to get out there in the first week um, to be able to find those points and mark them. And what they do is they go out and flag them. They spray paint on a, on a building, on a structure, something that's not going to move, um, where that wind water line is, make a note of it, and then the survey crew comes back and actually gets an accurate elevation of that of that uh, high water mark point. And an actual physical, uh, an XY location or a Correct. La latitude and longitude and an elevation. Correct. The, the flaggers get a rough lat long sort of, you know, handheld GPS and then the surveyors come back and get more accurate, you know, elevation as well as uh, XY data. So um, do you, you typically have, these are people going out in the field to do the flagging? Yes. Are, are, are they, engineers? Are they technicians? Um, um, it's, it's a little of both. Typically, um, for safety purposes, we have two individuals go out. So um, there's usually one more experienced person, one more junior person that would go out. And there's, you know, photo documentation and so forth that goes along with that. And are they, how are they recording, recording oh, data? Well, we've built um, a whole sort of tool suite to collect data along from sort of cradle to grave on the high watermark stuff. The first side of it is the planning aspect. You don't want to have points at too high a density or, or, or not enough density. So there's a planning exercise to sort of make sure that you've got a good distribution of these high watermark points flagged. Um, once that happens, then they come back into the centralized database um, and are QC'd. And if they're considered appropriate of reasonable quality, then they go to our survey crews, which we have, you know, multiple crews throughout the area. Uh, we dole those out, and um, and the surveyors actually go out and collect the more detailed information. So you described um, <coughs> deploying people and planning and deciding where to send people and how many people to send and the density of points that you need to have collected. Right. Um, how do you very quick, and you need to send people out almost immediately after the storm has passed, right. how do you know the extent of damage at that point? What kind of information do you get that tells you roughly what total area you need to cover and where, what areas are most 
right. Uh, well, and the, you know, in, in historically, it's been it's been really a sort of you know visual inspection kind of process. You know, I'm I'm at such and such a town, and this town is is not damaged or is significantly damaged. Those sorts of things, and that's where remote sensing can imagery can really help us. Post event imagery to allow us to deploy people more effectively and to put them in the places that they really need to be. Um, so you would need it quite quickly, within correct. a day or two after the event, but it would not necessarily have to be incredibly accurate in terms of its geo-referencing. That's correct. You need to just sort of get an overall big picture and be able to identify towns and roads and things that you can use in planning. Correct. But you don't have to have actual really accurate coordinates off the imagery. Yeah, and the team leaders, you know, essentially will tell a, a particular team, I want you to go to this town or I want you to go to this quadrant of the town. They won't tell them to go to a particular structure, etc. It's up to the flaggers to identify a high water mark that they think is 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 really clear and that they can get it, you know, uh, collect well. So there. a roughly geo-referenced <coughs> image produced very quickly within one or two days after the event would be really helpful. It's very for helpful. For the planning. Absolutely. Now, once the information is collected, you have a lot of people out in the fields collecting data, collecting elevations, collecting all these survey points, I'm, uh, and that you're going to use to eventually map a water surface. Um, is there some quality control process? Um, how do you know uh, if you have a thousand of these individual points that were collected? Is there a way to identify a bad point? Well, there is. I mean, obviously, if there, you know, if there's large discontinuities between neighboring points, um, that's a that's a pretty strong indicator. Um, but generally, um, from the quality standpoint, it gets to um, looking at the photos that were collected by the flaggers to get a sense of, you know, how how well do we think this, how well defined do we think this point is, um, and then. Once you have those points, you, you sort of end up with this very blurry picture, is the way I kind of think of it at the beginning of the process, and it gets increasingly clear through time. And the you know the the um, topographic information is valuable because if you can use the offset from the ground surface to the uh, to the flag location, even just you know rough flag information, you can begin to start to see that water, the eventual water surface elevation that will come from a high water mark survey. And you can then, you know, the surveyors, you can then overlay that data as that becomes available. So it's, it, you know, it's, the goal is not to wait until all the, the, every point in the data set is complete before you start to evaluate the next step. You want to sort of see these things in increasing clarity through the process. So I heard you say that some roughly geo-referenced imagery turned around very quickly would be helpful in terms of planning, deploying, mobilizing, um, getting a getting everyone out in the field collecting data. Once the point data comes back in, if we had a, a more accurately geo-referenced image at that point, we could compare um, the location of the point and what we can see on the aerial photo to the ground photos that were taken and make sure that the ground photo and the point is really located in the place it's supposed to be. Yeah, I think it's another it's another point that helps you kind of from the QC standpoint. It it makes sure that you've got what you think you have. You know, it's easy in the field to make those sort of disconnects between images and and textual records that you collect in the field. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about the top, um, topographic data. If we're measuring the height of water above the ground surface, mm -hmm. that having a a terrain model that represented the ground surface, a fairly accurate terrain model to add that water depth on top. Yeah, that well, that, and that's very valuable in, in the, um, the pre-survey portion of the project because you have, um, you have no survey data. You're, you're only collecting relative elevations, essentially, from the flagger's perspective. Um, so to have topographic data that you can, you know, bare earth data that you can use the, the elevation that was observed by the flagger as an offset, then you've got, you, you do have that water surface elevation. You're kind of mimicking what the surveyors will ultimately give you. And once we come up with this water surface that's been a three dimensional water surface that represents the extent and the depth of flooding, mm -hmm. how is that used? In well, it's used for for a, you know a variety of reasons. Um, a couple of them are um, one to to be uh, used to validate models, storm surge models, and things like that. Uh, Add surge and surge models like that. 
uh, and also to, to look at the effectiveness of uh, floodplain maps um, as they go through and, and reevaluate those maps. They may use that data to, to validate whether they're accurate or not. So be comparing a real storm to the to a theoretical predicted or theoretical correct. storm that's represented on a flood map. That's right. Might tell someone whether or not that flood map really needs to be updated. That's right. That's right. Um, there's another application I understand that has to do with we talked about it early on, um, delineating the difference between wind damage and water damage. And mm -hmm. Why is that important? Well, I, I'm not a, an expert in this either, but from my understanding of what, where that gets used, and it's it's been a pretty um, it's been a pretty visibly publicly visible uh, problem is um, insurance companies. Insurance companies, flood damage will pay for flood damage, not for damage caused by winds. There's a there's a big um, uh, push to understand where that wind water line is and which structures are affected by flooding and which ones are affected by wind. So my homeowner's insurance would pay for wind damage to my house, mm -hmm. but I'd have to go to the, I would have to have had flood, flood insurance, insurance specifically to cover water damage. That's my understanding, yes. So knowing where the line is between water damage and wind damage is an important part of the storm. Insurance claim settlement, that sort of thing. Recovery. Correct. How is that currently done? Or is that also... Uh, you mentioned in our earlier our conversation that as people go out in the field, they're looking for clues, uh, the debris field, um, direction of trees falling, d certain kinds of damage to structures. Mm -hmm. is it, it's been typically the wind water delineation is done by sending people out in the field to make observations. Yes, absolutely. And historically, I know in some storms, they've even sent individuals on like helicopters where they're able to, to see that pattern from the air, which is exactly where remote sensing can help you, keep you off helicopters, but um, to be able to start to roughly put that line in so that when you get individuals out, out on the ground, you're able to target those folks to the right locations. So if we were able to, as geospatial professionals or remote sensing experts, again, um, provide that kind of accurately geo-referenced imagery, then may, a lot of this wind water delineation might be able to be done in the office rather than in the field. Certainly for the planning aspects of it and to put people in the right location, yeah, it could be done in the office or it could be done even in a distributed environment where you may have more senior individuals that may not be geographically even in, in the location of the affected area could actually provide assistance in targeting people on the ground and making sure that, you know, we're using those resources effectively because it's very costly to have people there. Right, and then the people that are sent to the field could be, in a sense, more validating the remote sensing result rather than picking up being the only source of data. Right. It would be more of a ground truthing than could be done maybe, you know, a small percentage of points would need to be collected to validate the remote sensing results rather than trying to gather all the data. Yeah, I could certainly see an instance where um, over time, you know, as sort of people began to, to train their eye, if you will, using remote, remote sensed imagery to be able to, to identify those lines, you could maybe begin to start to sample, if you will, on the ground and, and, and be very uh, efficient in doing that. Does the wind water delineation often follow topographic features? I'm imagining that, you know, flooding would follow topography, therefore, having not only an aerial image, but also some kind of three-dimensional topographic data to combine with it might give some clues as to where the yeah, I think delineation it's a, is between wind and water damage. It's certainly a strong indicator, but uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of processes involved with wave runup and all those sorts of things, coastal engineering type processes that, uh, that are way too difficult to, to try to model with simple topography. But yeah, it is, it's, a, it's a strong indicator. So I'm getting the sense that the remote sensing could be a really valuable support tool in planning, in validating field results, and in also making some sort of large-scale um, depictions of, of the, the record of the storm um, that could really enhance a lot of the traditional field survey techniques and Oh, absolutely. I mean, you could use it through the entire disaster life cycle 
in you know pr certainly in the in the response phase that we've been primarily talking about, but also in preparedness and mitigation and so forth. So, yeah, it's absolutely it can be used in many many locations, many places throughout that cycle. Well, this has been really helpful, and I think based on our conversation, I could um, potentially put together um, a s some technical specifications for remote sensing imagery that we could um, kind of have have ready at hand. Uh, in, a, in an emergency response situation. Okay. So, thanks yeah. for your time. All right, thank you.